Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. You guys did it. You made me do it. You guys, you, yes you, you made me make this episode. You. I'm talking to all 21 of you who voted in the Discord poll about what color armor we should wear, and yes, that's why we're making this episode. You is your fault. Yours. And the wolves. Anyway, yes, we are still taking a bit of a break from the building. We have a lot of rifts over there. And I find that wintertime is a better time for building, or at least times you're not having to deal with things like crops. And the things that you can't do during winter are best done not in winter. Things like adventuring. And for adventuring, you want better armor. So today, we're going to use a whole lot of this a few of these, a bunch of these, a few of these, and probably a couple of these. Why do we need all this junk? Well, you're going to find out today, after I pick these things up. And I think that we should get to it. So now that we have a lot of flax coming in, and we have almost a full harvest of flax ready for us right here, we're going to have plenty of linen with which to make cloth, with which to make armor. Also plenty of flax grain for feeding our animals again, finally. We were almost out of that. Now, if we wanted to, we could just take this regular old linen, and we can make hats and things out of it, if I can remember how to do them. I can't. Ah, there we go. Okay, we would need some of these as well. So we could make some armor out of regular old linen, and we get some pretty decent armor for wearing around town, i.e. our day wear. However, since we have the class exclusive recipes turned off, we have access to a better form of armor using not regular linen, but cloth. And this comes in a multitude of colors. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we can do as far as Gambeson. So you'll see here, if you look in the handbook, that we have Gambeson's helmet, body armor, and leg armor. And these all have the same stats because they are a set. As you can see, they have a flat damage reduction of 0.7 hit points, a percent protection of 70%, protection tier 2, and they reduce our healing effectiveness by 17, increase our hunger by 3%, and our walk speed by 2%, or decrease it actually. And these of course are additive, so the healing effectiveness of a full set is roughly 50%, hunger rate is plus 9%, and walk rate is minus 6%. However, since we have the class exclusive craftables turned off, we have access to the tailored Gamboized armor, and they come in every color that the game has. Blue, brown, gray, black, green, orange, purple, or this is pink, I guess. This is a plain cloth, i.e. undyed. Purple, red, white, and yellow. And 21 of you voted, well, actually 20 because of the way that the polls work, 20 of you voted for purple, and it wasn't even close. The next highest winner, or second runner-up, was green at a whopping 10 votes. So, purple armor it is. You guys, you're making me do it. Now, to make purple armor, we need a couple things. One, we need the cloth, which we can get by simply putting some linen in our crafting grid with some sticks to make plain cloth. And then we also need a mordant. A mordant is what makes your dyes stick to your cloth and stay color fast. And for that, we need to grind up some of this cassiterite. Because what we'll do with it is we will pulverize it into crushed cassiterite. We'll throw it into some water to make diluted cassiterite. And then we can throw the plain cloth in there to make mordanted cloth. And it will take about eight hours of sealing. Once we have our mordanted cloth, we can throw it in a vat with some purple dye to make our purple cloth. And then we'll be done. The purple dye is made with either black currants or blueberries. And that's why at the end of last episode, I said that we were going to do something with these black currants in particular. So I'm going to go ahead and harvest these, and hopefully we have enough. I think we do. If not, we have to go on a bit of a hunt, because I haven't planted the rest of my berry bushes yet. Silly me. But we have 45 black currants. I think we should have plenty. I guess I'll find out. But how do we crush this cassiterite into the crushed cassiterite? Well, unfortunately, it is not quite as simple as taking a hammer and crushing it in our crafting grid, because this just turns the chunks into nuggets, and we can't use the hammer on the nuggets to turn them into 
crushed cassiterite. No, instead we need to get into some more automation. And I think what we'll do, joy, a nice quiet day. I think what we'll do is we will temporarily turn this windmill into our pulverizer windmill. And I think we'll do it by probably bringing, oh, I don't know. We might just do a temporary setup here so we can get our armor going because that way we can actually get this done and eventually we will move our windmill and everything set up over to our new house. But that probably won't be for a little while because we need to build out our first floor, get our second floor in, and then we can start building our windmill on top of that. Although I guess we could build a little spindly windmill and fix it up later, but that might be that might be what we do. Now we are going to need a second barrel, so let's go ahead and get that going on. Do we have any wood already? Yes we do. There we go, second barrel, all done. And I'm just going to go ahead and put our barrels down here. We will do right here and right here. And let's go get some water. You know what? I think I realized a goof. We're going to take the barrels upstairs because getting water down here is a pain in the butt. So let's just leave these stones here and we will do our dying outside under the eaves. There we go. Much better. Let's get our bucket. And let's fill these up. Okay, we have two full barrels of water. We can get rid of this now. Oh, we might need that in a second, actually. Because you have to look at the ratio of your dye material to the water. And it's often in multiples of four, which means that 50 liters isn't going to cut it. Let's take a look here. To make purple dye, we need four liters of water and four of our berries. I could go for like three more berries, but that's okay. So we're going to need to take out some of this water. There we go, 44. We can leave one berry out, tuck these in here, and then we're going to seal this for eight hours. And we're done with that part. Let's move on then to the lack of wind, and let's get to making a pulverizer. Now, a pulverizer consists of basically three parts, well, actually more like five parts by itself, and then its connection to your powertrain, which will, of course, come down from here after we move our quern. And you're going to need some specific materials. You need at least one, actually just one, piece of specifically granite rock, or I think you can use, yes, peridotite, andesite, granite, or basalt. Although I'm pretty sure you'll still only get the gray-colored base from the pulverizer. As you can see in the recipe, you need a saw, and we're also going to need a chisel. So let's get those out and ready here. Check. And we're going to need a few axles. Probably a bit more wood. If I recall, this is a pretty wood-hungry recipe. And we're also going to need at least four ingots of at least tin bronze. You can't use copper for any of this. You need to use tin bronze or better. So bismuth bronze, or black bronze, iron, meteoric iron, and steel are all fine. So we have four right here. Two of these are going to go into making a plate. The other two are going to be in making the pounder caps that will go on the ends of the wood pounders in the pulverizer. Now, pounder caps do come in three flavors. There is bronze, well, five flavors, but three of them are bronze. But bronze, iron, and steel. And with bronze pounder caps, you can pound basically tin and alum into pulverized material in order to make your pulverizer. There are other materials that we can crush later on, but we will need better pounder caps for that. So let's go ahead and we're going to get our smithing done here. And let's get these pounder caps and our plate going on.
Okay, we've got our metal parts that we need. Let's go ahead and start building our actual pulverizer parts. We're going to need two of these pulverizer pounder legs. I believe they are made... I have no idea how they're made. There we go. And you will need three logs for each one. They are mighty large. And then we need a whole bunch of wood to make our pulverizer frame, and I think this should do it. No, we're a little bit short. Put our granite block down there, and our saw in the middle, and we get our pulverizer frame. Lastly, we then need to build the pulverizer toggle, which will make these pulverizer pounders go up and down and smash whatever we put underneath them into smithereens. And for that, we need one of these wooden axles, we need a plate, we need a chisel, and we need a hammer. Like that. And pulverizer toggle. So we now have all five of the parts that we need to build out our pulverizer. We have the... Actually, it's six, I guess. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So, six parts, I stand corrected. We now need to figure out where we're going to put this. And I am thinking that up here is the place to go. Let's go ahead and stand back as we break down this support here. Woo! Crash. Let's get you picked up, and let's move this out of the way. Let's try and just do one additional gear. I think we will need some more axles, but I think we can get away with just one more gear. And yeah, let's do one more axle which means fat. So there we have that. And now we need one more angled gear because the pulverizer is driven from the side, not the top or the bottom. So we're going to need to make one of these angled gears that I always forget how to make. There we go. We got saw, we got hammer, we got chisel, we got sticks, we got resin, fat, and a log. And there we go. We well, you know what? Nope, actually, that should be good. Now, brace yourselves, folks. This is going to be kind of ugly. But there we have our beautiful pulverizer setup. Not floating in midair. No, not, not us. I would never do that. See? It's not floating. Perfect. It's beautiful. Maybe we'll, like, make this out of cobblestone or... Ooh, brick. Here we go. Let's put some bricks down instead. There we go. Perfect. Now, you see, it's not doing anything at the moment because it needs to have its toggle inserted. So, there we go. And then we need to put in each of these pounders individually. So, there's one, and there's two. And then we need to get our pounder caps and right-click with them. And now we have a functioning pulverizer. And we even have a bit of wind with a strong breeze to get it going. Now, using this is pretty simple. You take your Cassiterite, or whatever else you are pulverizing, and you right-click with it. You can put up to two of them. Oh, nope, just one at a time. I could have we could do two at a time. Oh, you have to actually click on both sides. Okay. And you'll see that we got one pulverized Cassiterite out of that, or crushed Cassiterite. And that's because Cassiterite is kind of the worst of these. It has a two-thirds chance. It's, actually, it's listed as 0.7, but it's a two-thirds chance of turning into crushed cassiterite. So for every three we put in, we should expect to get two out. Doing it this way by hand is kind of inefficient, right? I mean, we have to stand here and right-click in both these locations and wait for our stuff to come out and pick it up. Well, we can automate this to an extent if we want to. And we got nothing out of that one. Beautiful. We can actually automate this in a couple ways. And we're going to do one of the ways, but not the other. We are going to come over here, and this is where we're actually going to be able to get our copper on, is that we can make a copper chute. And we can do that with two copper ingots, and we'll turn these into copper chute sections.
there we go, we have our copper shoot sections. We can take them in our crafting grid, like this, and make an elbow shoot. And you need an elbow shoot because we're going to do... So we're going to tuck this right there, except not quite. Let's see if we have an actual chest we can attach this to. Hey, we do, look at that. Let's see if we can get this fitting in where it belongs here. There we go. So what'll happen is this chest, whatever we put in it, will get pulled into the chute and will get pushed into the intake of this pulverizer. And then as it finishes, it will be pushed out to us. Now, if we wanted to, we could take three copper plates and make a chute, or rather a hopper. And put the hopper here and have the hopper feed into a chest. But we only have a little bit of copper left over here. And we're actually getting kind of short on copper here, and I have some plans for some of this, so I wanted to save that if we can. Now, as far as how much crusted cassiterite we need, we don't need a ton. As I recall, we only need 10 to fill up this barrel here. Let's find out. Yeah, there we go. So, I'm going to get a little bit more of this, maybe another 10, and round out... Maybe two more barrels worth. That way, when we want to make our new dies for anything else we want to make, we will have the ability to do that without waiting for more crushing. All right, we got 21. That's a whoopsie on my part, but that's okay. Now, if we wanted to, we could also use the poor chunks. These would have a one-third chance of turning into the crushed cassiterite, but given that I wasn't sure we are going to have enough wind, I didn't want to risk it. I'm going to go ahead and tear this down and get rid of this clink clunk clink clunk noise and we will get on to what to do with our cloth and our dye then. Oh, and also, when you break this, it explodes into a million pieces. All the pieces must go into it each time you need to rebuild these things. Alright everyone, that's all put away and our house is back to normal with our howling pit and our growling pit. Of course, giving us a nice serenade. I love it. Now, in order to make... Would you... Would you... Mind my goodness, wolves. Now, in order to make our tailored gambolized armor, we're going to need 16 pieces of linen, and specifically 16 pieces of cloth, or bolts of cloth. We will need four pieces of flax twine. We will also need three sets of sewing kits, and each of those is made with four flax twine. And there we go. So we have our linen, we'll be turning that into bolts of cloth, like so. There we go. Our flax twine goes the... all right, we have to go like this to make the sewing kit. There we go. And there we have all that. Now, we have plain cloth. We could, of course, make some plain cloth tailored gamboized armor. But that is not what you guys voted for. So we're going to go ahead and tuck this all into here. And we will get 16 Mordenton cloth after 8 hours of sealing. And I believe that it takes 4 liters, or no, 2 liters, to make Mordenton cloth. Yes. So this barrel will do up to 25 pieces of plain cloth. I'm going to go ahead and toss a few more in. Because as we go adventuring and our armor gets damaged, we want to be able to repair it. So I'm going to go ahead and make just a couple more. Maybe like four pieces or so. And that should do. Although actually, I probably ought to figure out we need 22 pieces of cloth to dye to fill that out. So maybe we should go ahead and do a full 22 in here. Why not? There we go. 22 plain cloth, and we will get 22 more than the cloth after that. So we have 8 hours to wait. Let's kill some time.
Alright, what a productive night. Now you may have seen me make this over here, a bismuth bronze cleaver. The cleaver is a tool that is used for culling your herds a little more humanely and a little less frantically. We're not quite ready for it yet, but what you can do is once you get to generation 3 of any of your animals, you can then kill them in one hit by right-clicking with your cleaver. You'll, well, I can't demonstrate here, but you'll do a big, long chop. Make sure that you are still looking at the animal you want to until the animation finishes and the animal goes down. Otherwise, you might hit the wrong thing. But I wanted to get that ready so we have it when we need it. And I think it's been about eight hours, so hey, here we go. We still have six liters, or three pieces of cloth worth of cassiterite left. Let's go ahead, and we're going to toss these into our purple die over here. There we go. And now you wait again. Let's kill some more time. Jasper. Jasper, shame on you. You were hiding this alum all along. Shame on you. So Jasper here is holding on to several pieces of alum chunks. Now, alum is a very nice material. It can be used also as a mordant, but it is very hard to find. At least I have not been able to find alum out while prospecting or while mining in general. But let's go ahead and buy some. He's selling them eight at a time for five each. That's about as good a deal as I think it gets. He's got three. Sure. That will save us on some tin. I'm also going to buy some of this parchment, and we're going to hang on to this. He only has two. Why is he giving me that many? Very strange. But we'll hang on to this for when we get to working on our storage solution and actually getting that filled up. I have not moved in yet. I am however going to sell him three of these to recoup some of those costs. And here you can see that he will also buy this owl chest we found. I am not interested in getting rid of our owl chest. I think it looks too nice. I would love to get some farming vessels. If we could find a treasure hunter trader, we could actually sell these back to him at a profit. Thank you, Jasper. Looks empty, but in actuality, we have 22 purple cloth. All right. Well, I'm going to put away the things that we just gathered in this last session of waiting for our cloth, and we'll get to making us some very shiny armor. Okay, everyone, let's get to making us some armor. So, we are going to make the chest piece first, which I believe is something a bit like... Not quite like that, apparently. Ha. You go here. There we go. And then, of course, we have the headgear. I'm just going to go ahead and use the cheat sheet for this. 
Black twine there and there. And then, of course, the legs. And we will have six pieces of cloth with which to repair armor in the future. And there we go. We have some purple tailored, gameboyized armor. Let's put it on. Boy, are we outrageously purple. We are incredibly purple. But I kind of like it. It has sort of a lavender trim to it. Lavender and gray alternating zigzag stitches. I like it. Now, several things to note about this armor that make it important to us. One, it is tier 2 armor. Which means that it offers basically maximum protection for, well, for its other stats against both wolves and bears. Now, we still aren't going to want to face tank any bears, but we can probably take some wolves without too much trouble. As long as we don't get surrounded and beaten up by three or four of them at a time. One or two? Absolutely. Bears? Mm, this armor will let us survive a little longer against bears, but importantly, this armor does not slow us down. You'll see it does not have any reduction in move speed, just healing and a little bit of hunger. A tiny bit of hunger. Now this does mean that we might need to graduate from our current healing, which is just these horsetail poultices from reeds, which give us two hit points because now they're going to give us, what, 1.4 hit points instead of two. And that isn't a whole lot. That means a stack of these wouldn't even bring us up to full health from down here somewhere. So we might want to upgrade that, and I might do that in the next episode. Also, because this is tier 2 armor, it means that it will stand up to the attacks of tainted drifters without getting too badly damaged. That means we can go down to about mm, Y40 to 30 or so. Now, in those areas, we will still start seeing the corrupt drifters, which are tier 3. However, we won't take quite as much damage from them as we would with our copper armor. Now, this does mean, for better or worse, that our copper armor is kind of useless to us now. It has actually kind of worse protection. It only has 0.5 reduction and 75% reduction, whereas our armor is 0.75 and 75%. So it is 0.25 hit points more absorbent flatly than our previous armor was. And since it is tier 2, then it just beats it out in general. Also, all the other stats are patently better. We can use ranged weapons without penalty, and move without penalty, and so on. And we also don't have any, like, chank, chank, chank sounds of armor. Which is one reason why I don't like the other Gambus in armor, is that it kind of sounds like, I don't know, wet pieces of leather being drawn all over each other, like schlop, 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 schlop. And I just don't like listening to that 24-7, which is one of the main reasons why I use the tailored Game Boy's armor. Otherwise, I wouldn't care quite as much, but man, that sound gets... it gets old pretty fast. Now, before we wrap the episode up, I did want to go over with you some of the other color options that are available to us at this stage in the game. As far as creating dyes go, we have a lot of colors available to us. If we look in this trunk here, we have grass, and grass can be used to make green dye. We also have a couple options for blue dye. We have corn flour, which is great for blue dye, but I find that woad is even better because woad is unique in that when you make this woad blue dye, you don't actually have to use it on more dented cloth. You can just put the regular cloth in it by itself and come on, there we go. Plain cloth plus blue dye, well, woad blue dye, will get you blue cloth. No more than needed. If we wanted white dye, we could head down into our cave system here just a little ways, because we have some borax waiting for us to go pick it up, and I should go do that soon, because we can now. But you can make white dye out of borax. If we wanted brown cloth, we could just come here and chuck our cloth, without mordant once again, just regular plain cloth into this barrel of strong tannin, and we can get brown dye out of it. Or rather, brown dyed cloth. If we wanted some nice dark colors, like gray or black, we could use these metal scraps, or even... Rusty Gears, although I don't really recommend using Rusty Gears if you can avoid it. Although they are more renewable than metal scraps, so maybe so. But a few metal scraps in some water will turn it into gray dye. If you take the gray dye and add more metal scraps to it, you'll get black dye. But if you wanted some brighter colors, 
we can come down here and grab our onions or possibly some cranberries. Because onions and cranberries together will give you pink from the cranberries and then yellow and orange from the onions. Again, just like the gray and black from the metal scraps or rusty gears, one application of onions in water will give you yellow dye and a second application will give you orange dye. Now, all of these require mordant. The only ones that don't require mordant are the brown, the woad blue, and of course, no color whatsoever. Now, that does leave one color notably absent, and that is red. We don't happen to have any access to red dye at the moment. There aren't any flowers that provide it, unfortunately. Instead, we would have to get our prospecting pick out, and we would have to go and look around at all of these. You'll see here it says very poor cinnabar, 0.1 per meal. So we could possibly dig deep in this chunk here, and then we might come across some cinnabar, or possibly this chunk too. So digging deep enough, we could maybe come across some cinnabar down in the very bowels of the world. It tends to generate really, really low down. I'm talking, I have found it right on top of the mantle before. Now, cinnabar is somewhat unique in that it must first be ground into dust in a pulverizer first, before you can actually use it as dye. But beyond that, it is used the same way. So if you're looking to make a simpler set of armor than purple, because you don't happen to have enough alum or cassiterite to turn into mordant, you can certainly get blue, brown, or some plain cloth. And the plain cloth actually has a bit of a light blue trim to it. It looks pretty nice. But let's go ahead and we're going to tuck away our last set of improvised body armor that we'll ever use. And you'll go there. And that, as they say, is that. Well, everyone, I hope this was a fun and educational episode for you. I had a blast making this purple set. I think it's a very wonderful bright color and very interesting to look at. The blue, I think, is a bit washed out. It kind of fits with the game's colors a bit more, but I do like the purple for a big old splash of color. It's going to shock me every time I start an episode now, isn't it? So you can expect to see me wearing this purple armor pretty much nonstop until we get some better armor, i.e. iron, or maybe even some of the treasure armor we can get from luxury traders and from finding ruins. Anyway, thanks to everyone who voted for the purple armor. You guys made this happen. Let me know what you think in the comments. As always, my name has been Korazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.